everybody. Good morning. God bless you. I'll say let's stand, but almost all of you are standing. Let's stand anyways. Praise God. It's good to be in church. Thank God for his blessings. We've been looking forward to what the Lord's going to do today. And uh, as is proper in any service, let's just begin by magnifying the Lord. Would you put your hands to the Let's go over here. Give a praise to the Lord.
heart surgery and doing well, and we give God praise for that. I'm sure there are needs here in the house today. We have some recurring needs that we put on the screen. These are just needs that, um, whether we have a prayer request physically written out or not, we want to continue to pray for those needs. So please uh, uh, familiarize yourself with those names and lift them up in prayer. God's in this place. Yes. 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 special prayer this morning. Feel free to come right up. Watch the tripod, the area that we're broadcasting from. Walk, come right up and line up here. Please space out, wear your mask, and I'll wear mine, and I'll pray with you. The Lord's able to touch you. Would you lift your hands with me all over the house this morning? Let's open our mouth. Let's open our voice. Let's call upon the name of Jesus Christ. Father, you are the great physician. You have all power in heaven and earth. There is nothing too complicated for you. There is nothing too difficult for you. There is nothing too hard for you. We stand on the promise of the word of God this morning. The word is in the name of Hallelujah. We thank you for healing for every one of these needs, for every one of these situations. since 2017, but I've been off and on since 2007, and 
You know, the first couple of years that we went in, my wife had to quit work and everything. Our finances were tight because of the for the last four years. And we had kind of got upside down in taxes. I'm not, I didn't go to school. I didn't know a whole lot. And through Brother Edward and other folks, I you know, learned a lot. And my bookkeeper. Well, we were upside down last year uh, in personal and in federal and business taxes and in the thousands of dollars. And uh, we've been trying to pay that off, uh, making payments and everything. And my wife called me. We filed our taxes late this year just due to the difficulties of other things. But um, my wife called me yesterday. I was on the way home. And she said uh, the CPA called on Saturday, which is kind of ironic. He had a couple questions. But he told my wife, he said, told her a whole bunch of good news. And she called me and she says, i got several things to tell you. And I told her, well, she was very excited. And she says, well, first of all, we only owe a whole lot less than what we owe. I mean, just a couple thousand dollars in business taxes this year for federal, which was enough in the state, which was amazing for me because it was in the thousands of dollars, a whole lot more than that a couple years before. And then she's like, when the good news gets better, and then she's like, we also get credits for our children in the COVID-19. I said, like, well, praise God. She's like, and we're also getting money back. And I'm like, do what? And... Uh, <laughs> She kept going on with report after report that we're getting money back. And I was like, God, we were faithful. And the first thing I thought about was the prayer that we've been praying for many months now. It talks about taxes and incomes and rebates and checks in the mail. And that's the only thing I can think about. And the week before the presence of God, and I said, you are faithful in all your ways, God. And I just want to share that with you guys. If you guys are staying faithful with God, we're staying faithful with you. Amen. He's a faithful God. Prosper 
In Jesus' name. And the church said amen. 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 God bless our ushers as they come through the audience and wait on you. So good to see everybody in church today. I know we have some joining us via our live stream this morning on Facebook Live. We also upload every service after the service to YouTube. And so if you're watching this morning and you in the future forget to dial in on time or you miss our live stream, you can always catch the service after the service on YouTube. Amen. Let me go over our COVID schedule. COVID-19 schedule we have Wednesday night. Prayer 7 service is at 7.30. Our youth meet every other week. And then Sunday morning classes at 10, excuse me, Sunday morning prayers at 10.30. Worship is at 11. We are not having Sunday school classes uh, until further notice. Of course, we are going to start back one day, but we're just trying to, trying to be wise and uh, social distance and make sure that when we do gather, that we gather in a, in a way that everybody can try to come with and have a real good church. Amen? Amen. And it looks good to be here this morning. I'm telling you, we don't have a whole lot of empty seats. We're kind of spaced out, but we don't have a lot of empty seats, and that's a good problem to have. And we're going to this time and discuss what we need to do about that in the future. But, amen. I'd rather that than let's take out more seats. Amen? Amen. amen. Let me just mention, Wednesday night is going to be a very special time for our church family. This is our annual church business meeting. Please do not invite visitors for this one night only. I know we're apostolic and I know we win the loss, but just for this one service, I'm asking you not to invite guests because they're not going to enjoy it. It's going to be very boring and they probably will walk out thinking, I knew it. These churches all talk about money. Well, we have to have a business meeting at least once a year. It's just for our church family. Of course, if a guest walks in, we're not going to be mean or ugly. They're welcome to stay, but we're going to warn them that it's not going to be very spiritual. Praise God. Although the Holy Ghost is always present. Amen. Amen. We're going to go over our church budget, go over our church numbers, and I'll share some good news with you. I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised, and let's have a great time. Please be here for prayer at 7 o'clock. Please don't think of us as a business meeting. We don't need God at all. We need prayer. At 7 o'clock, and then our business meeting on Friday night, October the 2nd. Our young people are having prayer and a Bible study. And then the next day, Saturday the 3rd, they're having a time of outreach. We see the Donovan score details. If you're watching live stream this morning, you can give to the church by going online, newlifemurdersville.org. Top right hand side, there's a donate online button there, and you can give. Thank you for doing that in advance, or you can mail it to the church. 1225 Piney Grove Road, Kernersville. If you are watching online, please take a moment and like or love the stream, and then comment and please share, and that will help us. All right, how do we turn out on our building fund today? Amen. We'll put it on the screen there. Coming now. All right. 1170. Let's give the Lord a hand clap for that. Praise God. Cast that rod on the ground. 
Moses cast the rod on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before. Moses ran from his own rock. And the Lord said to Moses, Put forth thy hand, take that serpent by the tail. He put forth his hand and he caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. Verse 5 That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. Now let's go back to chapter 3, verse 14, and read one verse before we see it. Exodus chapter 3 and verse number 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Now this is an unusual verse. Moses is asking for some type of credentials from the Lord. God is saying, you're going to go talk to Pharaoh, and you're going to tell Pharaoh this, and you're going to tell Pharaoh that. Moses asks a very reasonable question. Well, who do I tell him to send me? And God said, I am that I am. Amen. And he repeats it. A lot of part of that verse. You say, I am has sent me unto you. Now, my title this morning is three words. Whatever you need. That's what God is. I am that. I am. Whatever you need, I am that. I am. Amen. Let's pray before we see. Father, we thank you for your word this morning in advance. I know that you've already were ministered to us through the singing and the music and the worship. Such a wonderful presence of God is here in the house today. I know that your word is very powerful. Paul said it is quick and powerful. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the light and sunder of soul and spirit. The color is a barrel and is reserved under the thoughts of the intense of the heart. We thank you for your word in advance. We believe you're going to help us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everybody say amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord this morning. Psychology tells us that you are able to determine a lot about someone's inner self when they write down five answers to the question, I am. So psychologists say, if you hand someone a blank piece of paper, number one, I am, question mark. Number two, I am question mark, and you do that five times, and they answer it five ways, you can take those five answers, and you can extrapolate a whole lot about that person just from those five answers. People might answer, well, I am American. I am Chinese. I am Russian. I am Latino. I am African. Or they may say, well, I'm black, or I'm white, or I'm yellow. Or they may say, well, I'm Gentile. I'm Jewish. It's interesting to see how people categorize themselves. Somebody might say, well, I'm tall. I'm skinny. I'm short. I'm overweight. Somebody might say, I'm fat. Somebody might answer, I'm bald. I'm hairy. I'm poor. I'm middle class. I'm rich. I'm successful. I'm unsuccessful. I'm Pentecostal. I'm apostolic. I'm Catholic. I'm Lutheran. I'm Episcopalian. I'm Baptist. Some might answer, I'm smart. I'm average. I'm not intelligent at all. I'm funny. I'm sad. I'm happy. I'm depressed. I'm sick. I'm healthy. Just five answers. Five answers from a patient tells a therapist a lot about that patient. And he gives them a snapshot or a quick overview of the mentality of that person. Because all of us have something just bubbling right beneath the surface. And when a person walks in, that therapist doesn't have two hours to kind of sit and get the whole background and all the details. They just say, tell me five things about you real quick. And whatever the top five things are that person is struggling with, it's going to bubble up to the surface. Right, right. Man, that's good. Moses was concerned about the authority issue at stake here in Exodus chapter 3 and in Exodus chapter 4. Moses was just a shepherd working for his father-in-law, Jethro, 
on the backside of a dusty mountain when God spoke to him out of a burning bush. Now, on top of that, Moses was 80 years old. And God proved to Moses his authority with the staff turning into a serpent and then back into a staff. We always preach about the staff turning into a serpent, but friend, there's another part in that miracle. It turned back to the staff again. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, that's pretty cool. Yeah. One thing, one second you're holding something, the next second you're running from that thing, and the next second you're picking it back up again. Yeah. Don't you know the next few days after that, Moses would just look at that staff like, I don't know about that. Thing. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to carry that or not. Amen. I'm going to put that outside of the house, park it outside of the house with the with the cattle and the goats at night instead of keeping it inside of my sleeping bag. Right. Next thing was, God had his hand turn into a leprous hand. Oh, yeah. And then it turned back to normal flesh. And again, we always talk about the hand turning into a leprous hand, but let's don't forget, God also turned it back. That's right. 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 Let's go to Exodus chapter 3, verses 11 through 14. Exodus 3, 11. And Moses said unto God, Who am I? that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. So let's set the tone for the story. Moses is 80 years old. He's standing in front of a burning bush. God is talking to him out of this bush. Moses, 40 years earlier, had fled Egypt when he killed one of the Egyptian guards. And now God is telling Moses, the same one that killed the Egyptian guard, the same one that was in line for the Egyptian throne, the same one that was born of an Israelite woman in captivity, Moses is now being told of God, you are going to go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Amen. That's right. So that sets the context of what's happening. Verse 12. And he said, certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Yes. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Now Moses had no problem with knowledge or with knowing who he was or who he was not. He is referred to as the meekest man in the Bible. Joshua chapter 1, verse 2. God refers to Moses as Moses, my servant. Moses did not have a problem understanding that he did not have adequate authority to persuade the most powerful man on the planet to let the Israelites go. In verse 13, he even asked God, what shall I say unto them? And God's answer is a little bit odd. Surely Moses thought as he waited with bated breath that God was going to thunder out from the bush. Tell them the deliverer has sent you. Perhaps he would even say, tell them Pharaoh's worst nightmare has sent you. I have to believe that Moses was not quite prepared for the answer that God gave. Because God's answer was a little bit cryptic. Verse 14, I am that I am. You tell them that's who sent you. Right. Amen. Tell them the I am has sent me unto you. Brothers and sisters, what is God this morning? What do you need God to be today? Yes, come on. Whatever you need God to be, He's already said, I am that. Yes, yes, yes. I am. Amen. You see what's beautiful about the people of God? We all come to church this morning with different situations in our life. There are some that need healing in their bodies. There are some that need financial miracles. There are some that need a psychological, psychological infusion of hope and, and, and joy today. Yes. There are some that just need strength in your physical being. You're just tired. You're just wore out. There are some that need a little bit of hope today. There are some that need guidance. And what's beautiful about the smorgasbord of what God has laid out is not says I am that. Ken Gow's goal to help people that 
that were hurting. Some people just need a little boost. And I'm going to influence their lives in a positive way, he says. Kim Gow became a traveling missionary and with his family conducted crusades not only throughout America but in many foreign countries. And he established a magazine, a radio, television ministry, a youth outreach program. But sometimes even preachers get drained and discouraged and they wonder if they should consider another line of work. That's how Reverend Gow felt one day in the 1970s as he and his wife Barbara and their children were driving two ministry buses down I-75 just south of Dayton, Ohio. Reverend Gow was driving one of those buses and he was praying, God, am I doing any good traveling around like this, telling people about you, setting up these tents and breaking down all this stuff and traveling and pinching pennies and wondering if I'm going to be able to support my family? Is this all that you want me to do? One of Reverend Gow's sons spoke up and said, Dad, let's get some pizza. And still lost in thought, he turned off the exit to get on Route 741. One sign after another advertised a wide variety of fast food. And Reverend Gow said, Lord, a sign, a sign, that's what I need. I need to see a sign. Ken's son and daughter-in-law had already maneuvered the second bus into a pizza parlor's parking lot. They stood waiting as Ken pulled up. The rest of the family bounced down the steps, and Ken just sat there staring into space. He told his family, I'm not really hungry. Y'all go in and get some pizza. I want to stay out here and stretch my legs and just watch the buses. So his wife and the others went into the restaurant and Reverend Gow stepped outside. He closed the bus doors. He looked around and he noticed there was a Dairy Queen in the parking lot. He walked over and got on a soft drink and was walking back toward the bus, still pondering, just exhausted. You ever been there before? Just exhausted. Mentally, emotionally, physically, just tired. And he was wondering, man, you know, I just don't know if I can keep doing this or not. And all of a sudden, he heard a phone ring. This is, of course, way before the days of cell phones. And that jangle was coming from a pay telephone in a booth at the service station right next to the Dairy Queen. Now, here's an age test here today. How many of you remember pay telephones? <laughs> we went to the courthouse to get our marriage license Thursday. And God is my witness. They had three pay telephones in booths. You can go inside and shut the boot. Man, you don't see that hardly anywhere. And I told him, I said, I can tell you this thing was built in the 40s or the 50s. Yeah. Yeah. And so Ken heard this jangle coming from a pay telephone in a boot at the service station right next to the Dairy Queen. As he approached the boot, he looked around to see if anybody in the station was going to come out and answer the phone. The gas attendant, everybody was busy. Oblivious to the noise, and so the ringing kept going. Ten rings, fifteen rings, twenty rings. And so finally, Ken walked over, held his coat in his left hand, picked up the phone with his right hand, and said, Hello? And the phone, the voice on the other end was the operator, and she said, I have a long distance call for Reverend Ken Gow. He said, You're crazy. This can't be. I was just walking down the road and the phone was ringing. This is a joke. Obviously, he's looking around for the candid cameras, you know, somewhere in the parking lot. His family was eating pizza in a randomly selected restaurant just a few yards from there. Nobody on the planet knew Reverend Gow was in that parking lot. And the operator said, Sir, I have a long business call for Reverend Kim Gow. Is he or is he not there? And of course, he said, Operator, I am Reverend Kim Gow. The operator said, are you sure? <laughs> and Ken heard another voice on the telephone. The lady on the other end said, that's him, operator. That's him. Mr. Cobb, I am Millie from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. You do not know me, but I'm desperate. Please help me. The operator hung up and kept, uh, Ken Gow said, what can I do for you? She began to weep, Millie began to weep, and, and Ken patiently waited for her to regain control. And she explained, I was just about ready to kill myself. And I started to write a suicide note. I began to pray, and I told God, I don't really want to do this. And in the middle of doing that, I remember seeing your picture on a track somebody handed me. And I thought, if I could just call that preacher on that track. 
She said, I knew it was impossible because I don't know how to reach you. So I started to finish the suicide note. And all of a sudden, numbers began to come to my mind. And I wrote them down. And I called that number. And you answered the phone. She said, I can't believe I'm talking to you. Are you in your office in California? And Kim said, I don't have an office in California. My office is in Yakima, Washington. She said, well, where are you right now? And he said, you don't know, you called me. She said, I don't know where it is, I just called the number. He said, I'm in a parking lot in Dayton, Ohio. Now folks, you can sit here and think, well, that could never happen to me. Let me tell you something. God knows exactly where you're at. Yes. In the Old Testament, I don't believe it was just a dialogue between Moses and God. I believe it was prophecy. I believe God was letting us know, I am that. I am. It doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter how low you sink. It doesn't matter what situation that you go through. You might feel like nobody else knows where you're at. You might feel all alone. You might feel destitute. You might feel afflicted. You might feel bewildered and just confused with life. And here's this woman about to kill herself. And God begins to give her digits that turn out to be a phone number for a pizza parking lot in Dayton, Ohio, for the very preacher that she wanted to talk to. Now you tell me there's not a God. Gal, when his family came out of the pizza parlor, they got in the bus and his heart was overflowing with joy. And he said, Barbara, you're not going to believe this. God knows where I am. Amen. That's why I'm preaching this morning that not only was Ken Gal in a situation that he needed, uh, he needed uh, encouragement from the Lord, but this lady on the other end of the phone also needed encouragement from the Lord. And God connected those two people together to prove that I am that I am. Amen. So I ask the question this morning. What do you need God to be today? Come on. He's that. Yes. What do you need God to be today? He's already that. Yes. You need a healer? He's your God. Yes. You need a friend? He's a friend that's even close to the yes. You need a financial miracle? He's Jehovah Jireh. Praise God, we heard a testimony about, about that this morning. Uh, that's, you know, Brother Brian didn't say that he got a $50,000 check in the mail, but I promise you, uh, when you get good news that you don't know taxes, it feels like a $50,000 check in the mail. Amen. God bless you, he's got in a whole lot of different ways. Amen. Amen. Whatever you need, need a friend? I'm a friend that's even closer than a brother. You need confirmation that he knows where you are? How about God making a telephone call yes. to a payphone in a parking lot yes. to let you know he knows where you're at? Yes. Somebody say amen. amen. For the world, you has always been one of my favorite singers and preachers. He's gone on to be with the Lord, but very large man, very, very, his voice just, just boomed out of him, almost like without any effort, it just boomed out of him. He pastored in Lake Charles, Louisiana for a long time. Died recently. I'll never forget him coming through and preaching in my home church. We should go there. We'll have him come from time to time. And Brother uh, Ewing tells the story of a young lady who was dying. And she had been very sick for several days, and the family had prayed very fervently that God would raise her up. This young lady was an apostolic young lady. She lived for God. She served God. She was not a backslider. She was faithful to the Lord. She had obeyed Acts 238. She lived a godly, apostolic life. And she was ready to meet the Lord if the Lord chose not to heal her. Amen. And I heard Brother Ewing say that in the last few minutes of that girl's life, as she lay there struggling to breathe, the telephone rang in that hospital room. One of the folks there that had gathered with the family picked up the telephone, and the voice on the other end of the line said, Tell this young lady, and gave her name, tell her her ride is on the way. Within a few seconds, she breathed her last breath. She slipped out into eternity. They were not able to trace the call. The telephone company, when they called the telephone company, they said, a call came in at this particular time. No record of that call ever being made. Amen. Now what happened, folks? Amen. I'm telling you, God knew that family needed 
need a word of assurance at that particular moment, at that particular time. Yes. God says, I am that. Yes. I am whatever you need. I am that. It's a blank check. I can meet your needs. I can help you right in the midst of your trouble. I'm preaching to somebody here today. Hold on a little bit hard, longer, honey. And then when you get to the end of your rope, I preached the message years ago. Tie a knot and hang on. Praise God. God is never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. It might seem like all hell. about a time when he and Sister Godier had been in Durham for only five years. They came to Durham in 1973. This was around 1978. And they were really struggling to build a church. Finances were low. Crowds were low. Attendance was low. And they had just received an invitation to accept the pastorate of a very influential church back in their home state of Missouri. They wrestled with that decision. They had two very small daughters at the time, Lisa and Cindy, and all the families back in Missouri. They did not have one family member in North Carolina. But God had called them to Durham, North Carolina. Right. And so on a Sunday afternoon, they discussed the situation very extensively over lunch. And both Bishop and Sister Godair had, had spent many hours in prayer and fasting about this choice that was looming in front of them. And Bishop Goodyear told Sister Goodyear that he felt God was going to help them make a decision. That night at church, they had Sunday night church, he asked the small congregation if there were any testimonies. And one by one, every single one of those people in the church stood up and expressed their appreciation to Bishop and Sister Goodyear and said stuff like, if you had not come to this town, I'd be lost and on my way to hell. This went on several minutes. Finally, Mr. Goodyear said, he looked at Sister Goodyear, she was on the organ, and tears were flowing out both of their cheeks, and he said, I think God just gave us our answer. Amen. Within 12 months, they had a breakthrough and began to have great revival. Amen. And of course, uh, my home church is one of the largest Pentecostal churches in North Carolina. $18 million worth of property, two uh, sanctuaries, a family life center, rental houses, 30 buses, and thousands of people have come to the Lord because of their ministry. Thank God that He knows where we're at when we need Him the Lord.
dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Somebody say amen. Some of you may have heard me share this story before. In 1980, Dave Carr, 25 years old, was from Bangor, Maine. And he started to feel one of those inner urges that defy logic and reason. He had a strong impulse to open a gathering place for homeless people. And he said, I thought of, if I got them a soft drink or coffee and something to eat, some words of encouragement, most importantly, we teach them a Bible study and let them know Jesus loves them. So this nudge began to be stronger over the next several years. Dave argued with that. He said, how can I open such a place? He had always lived the life of service and helped with similar projects through the church, but he was a truck driver. He was not a minister. He was not a psychologist. He had a young family to support, and there was nothing left over for rent for a homeless shelter. The whole idea was impossible. But it was one of those things he just couldn't get away from. The Lord began to deal with him. Street people led hard lives. He knew that. Not only hungry and often cold and Maine's harsh winter climate, they were vulnerable to threats uh, from those that were stronger than they were. Recently, a man had been murdered in the middle of the night and thrown over the bridge into the Penobscot River. The police never found the attackers. Amen. And the Lord began to talk to Dave and said, you know, without some place for them to go, that might happen again. Amen. So finally, Dave drove to downtown Bangor about 10 o'clock one September night. And he thought, I'll just ride around and look at some potential spots. I need some nighttime hours to think quietly and, and think about it. It'd be easier to check out storefronts without being distracted by traffic. And so he parked his car downtown Bangor, Maine. He began to walk through the neighborhoods looking at abandoned buildings. A lot of possibilities, but nothing definite. Three hours later, about 1 o'clock in the morning, he said, I need to get home. But he had not investigated Right over the river, the town of Brewer, right over the Penobscot River. And so he said, I'll just drive over the bridge, I'll look into Brewer, and I'll go home. So, matter of fact, he said, I'll, I'll just leave a car where it is, and I'll, I'll, I'll walk over the Penobscot River. So the street was deserted, he began walking up the bridge, a car approached from Brewer, and as the headlights caught him, the car slowed down, and Dave realized there were three men inside. Despite the cool September air in Maine, the windows were rolled down. And Dave heard one of these men say, hey, let's throw him over the river too. Throw him over the railings of the river too. And he realized these are the guys that killed that other guy. Car stopped, the doors opened, all three men got out and started running toward him. And he realized, I am the next victim. It had been on this bridge. These must be the guys. He said, Lord, Please help me. That's about all he had time to say was, Lord, please help me. You ever been in a situation like that where you don't really have time to say, Our Father, we're trying to help him. Father would be like, yeah. you yeah. know, kind of get this long prayer. You just say, Jesus! Yes. 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 That's about all the time you have to get it out. Right. You ever been there? Amen. This was one of those moments. Amen. Immediately, Dave felt a presence near him. He couldn't see it, but he could feel it. And he felt safe all of a sudden. His fear vanished, and he knew God is here with him. One of these men was almost on me. All three of them were very large and muscular, and the guy said, get him! And all of a sudden, all three men just stopped. They said, they stared at me, they looked to the right, and they looked to the left, and one of them, the ringleader, said, oh my God! And they turned around and almost tripped over each other, getting back in the car. When they sped away, he said it sounded like they were tearing the transmission out of the car. Uh -uh. I could still hear them cursing and yelling and screaming. Amen. And he stood there and he thought, oh, that was unique. Amen. Wow. Thank Amen. God. Amen. He, Amen. Thank God. he crossed the rest of the bridge. Danny, a friend of his, drove by, haunted him, and kept going, unmindful of what had just happened the narrow escape that David just had. Very next day, Danny, the guy that drove by, saw it and said, Hey, man, I saw that good stop for you last night. I saw you on the bridge. He went, what were you doing at 1.30 in the morning on the bridge? He said, I didn't have room for all of y'all in my car. <laughs> he said, 
said, all of us. It was me. He said, no, no, no. There was two big old cows right next to you. One on the left, one on the right. They were like massive. He said, that's the only reason I didn't stop. I couldn't get them in the car. Amen. Right. And they realized, yes. I am that. Yes. I am that. Yes. I didn't need a check right there. I didn't need a healing right there. I didn't need an encouragement. Right. What I needed was a shelter, was, was, was protection. Yes. I needed shelter from the enemy. Right. But if I could stand here today and give you example after example, true stories of how God always comes through. The devil, if you choose to serve the devil, he's never going to come through for you like that. Amen. He's going to steal your health. He's going to steal your finances. He's going to steal your marriage. He's going to steal your children. And when that all is done, he's still not happy. He wants your soul. But God says, whatever you need from me, I am that. I am. You just fill in the blank. You need a healer? I can heal your body. You need a friend at 1 o'clock in the morning on a bridge? I can be there. You need a telephone?
the study of what they call the open door policy. How many criminals go in and how many of them come right back in? The rest of Brazil has a 75% recidivism rate. In other words, three out of four prisoners, when they get out, are coming right back in. Amen. But in Jamaica prison, 4%. Amen. How is this possible? He said, I saw the answer. When my inmate guide escorted me to the notorious cell, once used for solitary punishment. Today, he told me, it houses the same inmate every day. And he said, would you like to see this in me? I said, sure. We reached the end of the long concrete corridor. He put the key in the lock and he turned around and said, are you sure you want to see this in me? Well, of course. I've been in isolation cells all over the world. I study prisons. I like to see this inmate in this cell. He slowly swung the massive door open and I saw the prisoner in that cell. A crucifix. Beautifully carved. Jesus hanging on the cross. And the inmate murderer, the guy that was walking me around, unlocking, turned around, looked at me with tears running down his face and said, he's doing the time for the rest of us. Moses looked at himself and saw what he was not. And that's why he said, who do I say? I said, I am nothing. So please give me something to take to Pharaoh. And God said, I'm not going to narrow myself down and tell you one thing. I'm just going to say, I am that. Jesus can fit the bill. There will never be a time when you need something and God will say, sorry, we'll refresh out of that this week. Come back tomorrow. Went into a grocery store recently. I love smoked oysters. Always have, always will. I just love smoked oysters. Went to the grocery store, and they were out of smoked oysters. And I went to the man, and I said, how can y'all be out of smoked oysters? I mean, there's not a whole lot of people that eat those things. You know, some people go, oh, gross, yes, I just think they're delicious. How can you be out of smoked oysters? She said, you know, we've had problems with the shipping, and, and you know, everything's on COVID. COVID, I guess oysters get COVID now. <laughs> Is ever blamed for everything. We're out of that. Come back in about a month. We should, they should be stopped back. You don't know, ever come down to this altar and lift your hands and say, Oh, God, I need a healing. And God say, Sorry, September's booked up. Come yeah. back in October. Wow. Okay. Yeah. My doctor called the other day and said, You need to get in here and get this appointment done. And we went back and forth, back and forth. And my dates didn't work with her dates, and her dates didn't work with my dates, and she went ahead and scheduled a date. And as it turns out, I'm going to have to cancel that one. Look, oh, you never have that problem with God. Yeah. You don't ever come down here and I say, oh, no, sorry. No, only just today. I'm all booked up. Let's see. I can get the end of the front seat if you want to hold up. God says, I am that. I am. Whatever you need. Yeah. 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 The Holy Ghost has been in this house all morning. Yes. Yes. Those of you that were here for prayer, yes. the presence of God was here early in the prayer meeting. Yes. Amen. I know we're socially distant. I know things are odd and you have a face mask on, but you ought to be able to lift your voice with me right now. Lift your hands with me right now. If you need